Well, Dr. Tate, I want to thank you for being on the podcast. And I wanted to start by asking you a little bit about your academic journey. You have two master's degrees and a PhD. And I love if you can kind of share a little bit about your choices of what you studied in school and like what made you make those choices. Yeah. So my mother used to say uh, when she was alive, what, what are you ever going to do anything but go to school? Um, <laughs> I, I, I thought from about the time I was about 16 that I wanted to become a, a pastor. I was an, I was a Methodist at that point. So I always intended to go to seminary. And so after I graduated from college, I did that. Uh, but while I was in seminary, I became interested in the idea of becoming a seminary professor, which of course, you know, requires a PhD. So I began thinking of, of going into doctoral work, but in the meantime, I graduated, and in the Methodist system, they uh, the, I, I was in the ordination process. They assigned me to a church, um, and it was just it was just not a good match with that particular church. Uh, I was 25 years old. I was an associate. It was a a place that needed older and wiser hands. They had been through a lot of trauma, and so after a year, um, I I you know, sort of parted ways with them and was sort of thinking, what, what do I do now? Because I was not, you know, I had not made application to doctoral programs. And I had become very interested in working in the library when I was in seminary. So I, there a, was a wonderful library school in Champaign-Urbana, where I was, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. And I thought, well, I'll go to library school because this is, you know, so I can support myself in my PhD. You know, this is, this is a good trade. Um, you know, I have skills that would, you know, fit with this. So went to library school. Uh, went then to Duke to get my PhD, did in fact uh, get a job as a librarian to support myself, got a job out of after Duke as that required a PhD and a library degree. And I thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do with my life. Um, I'm going to be a librarian. Then I got married. We had our first kid. My uh, my husband is also an academic. I met him at Duke. He had, He got a job. We had the baby. I decided to stay home with the baby. And one thing led to another. I was writing for Christian History magazine, and eventually, um, after the economic downturn in the late, like 2008, 2009, my husband lost his job. And at about that same time, um, Christian History lost its editor. And mm. so um, they, the magazine came to me and said, is this something you'd be interested in doing? Um, for which, I mean, on the history side, I have a PhD in church history, but on the editorial side, I have a bachelor's degree in English and I write a lot, um, but I had not, you know, trained as a journalist. So I had to learn a lot of that, how to produce a magazine uh, on the spot. Uh, and in the end, um, you know, I, I always thought, you know, I'm going to be a seminary professor. I'm going to be a, a librarian. Um, I did as I did uh, eventually become Episcopalian and become an Episcopal priest. I have a part-time church. So that worked out. Uh, but I never saw myself as a magazine editor. And yet here I am. And I've been the editor of Christian history for eight years. So and that, that is absolutely fantastic. And I just love how versatile you are and just adapting. Yeah, and I still find that the library degree, although I'm not actively working as a librarian, the training and in information and how information works and where to find it and how to organize it uh, is still really, really helpful to me. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not at all sorry about my time as a librarian. It was, it was a lot of fun. Well, to me, it shows just like your tremendous curiosity and wanting to like be able to know how to find information, how to research things properly and academically, and um, so yeah, just hearing that is just absolutely fascinating. So your latest book is focused on church history. And you've done a fantastic job of taking this like complex, complicated Christian history and condensing it down to make it very, very simple for even me that I could read it and actually really enjoy going through uh, a Christian history book. And sadly, I was realizing I've never read like any books dealing with like Christian history, aside from like, like learning about the book of Acts. Yeah. So and I have the cover here. This is my, I want to make me, you know, I, I set it next to the computer so I can show it off. So this is in, this is in a series that InterVarsity is doing, which is like philosophy in seven sentences, New Testament in seven sentences, Old Testament in seven sentences, my book. And eventually there's going to be a theology in seven sentences and maybe more, but those are the ones I know about. And the goal of the whole series is exactly what you were talking about to get a book that is, you know, short, uh, written in a in a conversational and not an academic tone, you know my audience in my head was adults in a Sunday school class who were who were motivated to study church history, but then went to go okay we want to do this in like six or eight weeks. Um, that was who I was writing for, 
Um, it has also been the case that since the book has come out and, and some people that read it, you know, in proof uh, that they have said it, it's really good to use with undergrads and several people have picked it up as a textbook for undergrads at like Christian colleges uh, or in, you know, like short intensive courses. Uh, so I'm very eager to see how they react to it because that, uh, that was a little bit further from my mind. Uh, because I really wrote it for the church, uh, but yeah, the the over the whole goal was you know so that somebody who didn't know anything other than what was in the Book of Acts could pick it up <laughs> and come away knowing okay these are some of the big events that happened these are some of the big names here's a after each chapter there's a short list of books so if you know monasticism really strikes your fancy here are five or six books you can go read to find out more about about what monasticism was like and is like so. Uh, you know, so there's avenues for deeper exploration, but, the, but my hope was that at least for Western Christians, and we can talk a little bit about, about the Eastern Church later, but at least for Western Christians, they could read this and think, okay, this is basically what I need to know to get a grip on what happened in the last 2,000 years. And that's really hard to do in 140 pages. I was super impressed because, uh, and also just the way that you wrote it in such a, uh, such a, um, um, a very casual making it very easy, breaking things down. Um, I was just following, I, I was reading it like a novel. Like that was how interesting <laughs> it was to me. That's you know a great what I mean? compliment. Well, I'm, I'm writing for Christian, I've, I've written for Christian history since 2003. The first time when the magazine was still at Christianity Today, which it was at that point, uh, the editor who was a friend of mine asked me to write um, a short piece for in 2003. So I've been writing for um, almost 20 years in that style and then i've been the editor for the past eight years and as the editor i have to there i have to produce like ten thousand words for each wow. issue of you know my editor's letter maybe it's less than that but yeah you know, a lot my editor's letter uh, did you know which has interesting short features and factoids and fun things about what's in the issue uh, a recommended resources list a timeline so there's all these things that i write for every issue in that style and then sometimes if it's a topic i know a lot about I'll write an article. So I've been writing constantly in a conversational tone aimed at people who are not academics for nearly 20 years. So the, the only challenging thing about the book was I had to, you know, 140 pages is short to get all of Christian history. And it's really long if you're writing it. Uh, you know, so to to think, OK, I'm used to getting to doing 1500 words or 2000 words, you know, for an article. And now I have these chapters and each chapter is 5000 words. You know, and how in the world do I organize that? You know, what do I talk about? How do I keep up that conversational tone and also get the, the information across? So it was not actually as easy to write as I expected um, because each chapter was so much longer than, you know, you ask me for a 1500 word article on Christian history, I can probably produce that for you in a day. You ask me for 5000 words, I'm going to go, wait a minute, now what do I do? So, Since you've been writing about Christian history for such a long time, did like the themes and topics that readers have been interested to you in asking you questions about, has that helped inform this book? Definitely. I, I mean, no, I can't think of anything specifically, but just overall, the, the goal of Christian History magazine was the same goal of the book, uh, has been for many years that when it was founded in the 80s, uh, that it was aimed at people like you who was like, well, I know about the Book of Acts and I know about now. Um, you know, and, and I want to know what happened in between, but but I don't, I don't really know where to go about it. So I was, um, you know, I was sort of guided overall by the topics that the magazine has covered and the way that we've covered them, you know, knowing, you know, and, and sort of filling in those and maybe spending a little bit more time on things that haven't necessarily been covered as much, especially in, um, you know, Christian history, the magazine is aimed at I won't say aimed at evangelicals, but the people who originally founded it were evangelicals for a time that belonged to Christianity today. So, you know, everybody wants to read about Martin Luther. You know, nobody wants to read about monasticism. You know, so I'm like, okay, well, we're going to talk about Martin Luther because he's really important. But we're also going to give a, devote a whole chapter <coughs> to monasticism. We're going to devote a whole chapter to the Second Vatican Council. Um, we're only going to devote five pages to the missionary movement. Because everyone's like, oh, the Great Missionary Movement. The Great Missionary Movement is a Protestant missionary movement. You know, when people talk about about it, it really was when Protestants discovered how to do missions. Catholics have been doing missions for several hundred years at that point. You know, and so I ended up downplaying that. And um, uh, one of the readers came back and said, you know, well, 
you know, you need to talk more about this. And, and I and I felt like saying, well, the fact the facts really don't support a greater place than I've given this in the book. You know, I talk about it. I talk about the Great Awakening and revivalism, and you know, but I sort of compressed all of this into one chapter. And and it, and at least for evangelical readers, they're used to hearing a story that's like a little, you know, a lot of the early church, a little tiny bit of the Middle Ages, a lot of Luther, a lot of revivalism and missionary stuff, you know, and then now. And I deliberately tried to subvert that story uh, in in the in the chapters that and the and the way that I organized it, the people that I picked to talk about, and uh, and the and the way it was was set up. At, you know, an ending, for example, with the Second Vatican Council, which you know is tremendously important for understanding modern religion, whether you're Catholic or Protestant, not so much for the Orthodox, but you know for Western Christians, and you know, and yet uh, for the for the intended audience, I, I thought, well, they're going to be going what? <laughs> so. Uh, but that was on purpose. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to ask you, because like what you just described is exactly like kind of my view of Christian history was that I had the book of Acts, had a little bit of, you know, I've read some of the church fathers, didn't really know what was happening really in the church. Um, I've read like little surveys here and there, but totally forgot them. And then like we had the Reformation and then like everything after that, I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, that's really interesting. But like that huge gap. That you're just uh -huh. talking about. I was totally like, I don't really know what's happening. Yeah, so I wanted I wanted very much to fill in that gap. Uh, so, so you know, and which I I hope that I did, and and then to go forward, you know, sort of from Luther on, not just refer you know referring back to the early church, but referring back you know what had happened you know in the Middle Ages to the monastic movement, to uh, the 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 eventual split uh, between what we now know as the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox tradition. You know, I wanted to be able to talk about Protestantism and Catholicism, you know, in the 20th century with all of that as the background. It's super helpful. So I want to start with like the, the first chapter. You start with the Edict of Milan, which I had never heard about before. I had heard of Constantine, like I took, you know, history in school. So I remember hearing about Constantine and, mm -hmm. and his involvement with Christianity. Um, but can you talk about like why did you begin the book with Edict of Milan? Yeah, well, we be, uh, when I talked to my editor and we and we sort of worked out the sentences together, uh, he 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 advised me to focus on on sort of when I say documents of state more than because I wanted to do some more theological sentences throughout, and he said we're going to do theology in seven sentences. He said I think you can best do what you're doing by looking at councils and creeds and. Okay, the 95 Theses was theological, but it was also a, a sort of political, you know, doctrinal, creedal statement. So that's how we ended up with the sentences as a whole. Starting with that one um, allowed me to talk about the great shift between uh, persecutor Christianity and legalized Christianity. And as I say in the book, I had a student once at Asbury who was not a Christian, but was in the class to finish out his degree, which was a whole long strange story but he his his firm belief was that was that Constantine by legalizing Christianity had had lost what Jesus had done that the church from the 4th century on was irredeemably apostate and you know that the early church the persecuted church you know the church in the catacomb you know, you know they had it right but, but and and I don't think that you know or I would not be an episcopal priest uh, but uh, but it governed sort of how I wrestled with that question because we uh, a lot of Christians don't know how to deal with the relationship between Christianity and power, um, and so it's very easy to idealize the early church, to look at the martyrdom, to look at the church, you know, the the wonderful church fathers who wrote before the legalization of Christianity and the beautiful things they had to say, and then we hit Constantine. I mean, the Edict of Milan is important. I mean, it's not that great of a document. It's not that long. It's not that interesting, uh, you know, but that's the, that's the hinge. It's actually the hinge that says that Christianity will be tolerated. It will no longer be persecuted. Then you have another document about uh, uh, some decades later that says Christianity is the religion of the empire. But this is the moment when we say, okay, we're not going to persecute you anymore for being, for being a Christian. And Constantine himself had this very complicated relationship with Christianity. Uh, you know, and so Christians have to decide, you know, and, and there were actually Christians serving in government because persecution was not everywhere at all times intense. 
you know, it, it sort of bubbled to the fore and then it would yeah. go down again. And in between in certain places, maybe actually you were a Christian. People knew that and you were still in the local government, you know, or in the army. Um, we know about Christians serving in the Roman army, you know, and then there might be a wave of persecution and they'd say, no, 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 you have to, you have to quit your job. So mm-hmm. individual Christians had wrestled with this, but now, okay. It's like, okay, we're not, you can't be executed for being a Christian. You can't be thrown in prison for being a Christian. Um, you don't have to sacrifice to the Roman gods in order to have a, a place in government or to be in the army. What do we do about that? Because an awful lot of the New Testament re- feels like it's written to people who are not in power. Um, right. And how do you translate that New Testament vision into a church that at first is tolerated and within you know less than 100 years is in charge? And the church did not always do that well. And the fact that the church did not always do that well is part of why I think Protestants look back at the Middle Ages and say, okay, we're not going to do that. Uh, But by not doing, by not looking back at that and, and looking more specifically at the ways in which Christians in power behaved, I think it gives a huge blind spot to Christians in power today. Because Christians in power today look back and they identify themselves with before Constantine. Mm. And, and I think they shouldn't do that, uh, you know, because that's not where Christianity is in this culture. You know, they need to look back and say, after Constantine, what happened and, and what can we learn from that? Uh, and that's what, what I think the huge importance is to this, you know, really very actually kind of governmental document, you know, is the whole moment in which in which this shifts and we're still coping with it. Yeah, that's a, what that's a fascinating, a, interest. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a thing, as my fourteen-year-old says. It's a thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's a thing for sure. Wow, I never. I, that's so interesting. The way you just correlated Christians in power today and Christians in power back then. Uh, because so often, and I don't want to, you know, get too political about this, but so often when you ask Christians who are in power today why they're doing what they're doing, they will say it's because they're persecuted. Um, mm. And in the United States. I'm sorry, Christians are not persecuted. Let's talk about going to places where Christians are being, you know, beheaded and driven out of their churches. And so for Christians in the U.S. to behave as though we're the early church when we're actually the Constantinian church is, you know, to me, that's wrapped up in so many of the, the things that are going on and the, and the issues and the you know political and spiritual tussles that are going on. Can you talk about like the spread of Christianity, what still fascinates me is that when Christianity was illegal, when you had these periods where Christians were um, were being killed, were being imprisoned, and the church was still spreading during that time, like that, that fascinates me. I was wondering your insights on that. And then once Christianity became legal under Constantine, how that, did that slow the growth? Did that increase the growth? Uh, I, well, I, I think... I think it is interesting. I mean, one of the the things that helps say to me that Christianity, there's something to this, is that spread, um, you know, of Christianity when it was not legal, and that there were so many people, you know, and the New Testament makes this really clear, who were who were willing to practice this persecuted faith and to die for it, and even if not to die for it, to to go to great uh, sort of personal lengths, you know, to practice it in secret, you know, there was something that had really transformed them, Um, you know, look at the Apostle Paul. But after Constantine, the church still spread. It was just now it could spread differently because especially once it became the religion of the Roman Empire, wherever the Roman Empire went, it took Christianity with it. Um, And it took you know, sometimes people will say, well, that was just, you know, they conquered these people and they said you had to be Christian and they baptized the king and the whole culture had to be Christian. Well, yes, but there were also, you know, people spreading a, a genuine faith along with that. Um, you know, many times those these kings, these rulers that became Christian, they 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 felt, they really saw something to it. They they wanted so I don't think you can just write it off the way some secular historians do and say, okay, we just, you know, it was just spread by empire. At the same time, when you have the ability to spread Christianity by baptizing the king and the king saying, okay, now my entire tribe is going to follow Christianity, you have a whole new need for catechesis, you know, for education, for discipleship, because previously in the early church, people would come and they'd say, we want to be Christians. So they say, okay, for three years, you listen to the sermons, you leave before we take the Eucharist, you do these particular things, you meet with someone who discusses 
theology, the theology of, of Christianity with you. You know, and, and there's this very, very intense thing set up so that when you are baptized, because, you know, you could be killed for being baptized. So when you're baptized, you, you, you know what you're getting into. Now a king may genuinely respond to Christianity and want his whole tribe to become Christian. But now all of a sudden you've got these people that have been, you know, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, uh, the Germanic tribes in particular, you know, like, you know, following a, a pagan faith, the king says, now we're Christians. And they're like, OK, you know, you're the king. That's fine. What's a Christian? And so, you know, all of a sudden you have to spread Christianity. First, you spread it first, you make the people Christians first, and then you go out and tell them what it means. Hmm. As opposed to in the early church where you told them what it means first, and then they said, okay, now, yeah, I, I want to do that. Um, and, you know, there was real catechesis, there was real education, there was real discipleship in many cases, and people were like, oh, yeah, I really want to do this. But in some cases, it didn't work out that well, and they didn't really know what it was they were practicing. So it became a very different way of, of spreading the faith after Constantine. Yeah. And, and you said something that uh, you mentioned in your, in your book about the importance of baptism and how like that act of baptism. And you, I think you mentioned that Constantine like that was baptized later in life. And I think you mentioned something about like that practice of being baptized later in life or towards the end of your life. Yeah. They did that a lot in the early church. Uh, be, part of it was because they, they, uh, there was a, Huge question, a theological question among many early Christians as to what happens if you committed some really serious sin after baptism. Uh, oh. I mean, we still have that question. I mean, think about, you know, so today somebody's a Christian and then for whatever reason they go in and you know, perhaps they murder someone or, you know, there have been cases where people have been convicted for like sexual assault and then they say, well, I've repented. You know, we're still actually wrestling with this, um, but we don't deal with it in the same way. What they did in the early church was oftentimes people would say they were really interested in Christianity. They would attend worship if you were not baptized you couldn't take the eucharist but they would hear preaching they would hear what became the canon of the bible those those scriptures read they would fellowship with christians and then they would when they were when they felt that they might be getting about to die and it was unlikely they were going to commit any serious sin then they would be baptized so and that was in many cases the early church solution to the problem of what happens when someone who has given their life to christ does something really awful. How do we do? How do we deal with that? And they dealt with it by by not fully giving their life to Christ until they were about to die, and that's, that's so, what Constantine that's, did. Yeah, that's so interesting. And 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 you're also pointing out like the complicated fact that um, government was kind of presenting Christianity as this is the religion. At the same time, um, what is this Christianity that you're teaching? And sometimes like as, as a, as a modern Christian, I'm looking back thinking, oh, they're thinking sometimes I'm having the assumption that their Christianity is the same Christianity as mine. You have the next chapter talking about the Nicene Creed and the development of like, really, what is Christianity? Yeah. Well, and I think that, I think that's important not to make, uh, you know, Christians from previous time periods sort of too much like us. I also think it's important. This is actually where I end up the book. Uh, if we get there in the allotted time to, uh, to say that what what I see in the New Testament, what I see in particular in, in Philippians 2, uh, which I quote at the end of the book, is recognizably the same. You know, we haven't changed the religion so much that, it, that it's not still about, you know, Jesus Christ who lived and died and rose again, you know, and putting your faith and trust in him and joining a community of believers. I mean, that's what the early church thought Christianity was about, and that's still at the best of times, what we think Christianity is about. So there, there's an underlying similarity. At the same time, if we think that in every detail of what we consider, you know, in our 21st century settings is what they thought, that's not the case at all. What they what they thought and believed can sometimes seem very alien, um, alien to us. And uh, in terms of the Nicene Creed chapter, uh, there's a there's a huge involvement. I mean, there's an involvement of the state in the in the establishment of the Nicene Creed because uh, Constantine, you know, all, you know, there were so many uh, bishops and other leaders who were sort of squabbling, uh, particularly over some ideas that have been brought up by Arius about what exactly the relationship was of G of Jesus Christ to the other members of the Trinity. And of course, the word Trinity isn't in the Bible. You know, people were hashing out. It seems. It seems from the biblical evidence and the evidence of the way that God has acted in people's lives that the best way to talk about this is that there's one God in three persons. And if I make any metaphor, I'm going to commit a heresy, so I won't. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Arius says, well, is Jesus Christ really equal to God the Father? Is there some way in which in which Jesus Christ is 
is, is lesser. You know, still very great, but lesser. And there were, you know, there were gigantic fights about this, and it was a big PR problem for Constantine. So, you know, genuinely, he's interested in getting the theology right. He's also interested in not having to deal with the PR problem. So he convenes these bishops and says, okay, have at it. Um, and what eventually gets hammered out, and it takes a couple of councils to do it, is what we now recognize as the Nicene Creed. The, the version we use today, if we if we really called it was, is the Nicene Constantinople and Creed, because mm -hmm. it took them another council to nail it all down. Um, but we, you know, we usually just say the Nicene Creed. Um, the way it, it was done at Nicaea, there were, it was not as detailed, particularly in the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, as they eventually hammered out. But, you know, that's all, that's all fairly minor. So they sit down for partially theological and partially political reasons, and they end up with this sort of amazing statement of what it means to believe in one God in three persons. Um, and it's, it's an example, I think, of something that I talked about all through the book, which is that it, you know, Christian theology doesn't exist in a vacuum. Christian belief doesn't exist in a vacuum. There are always cultural things going on. There are always political things going on. That was the case about the, within the, in the early church. That's still the case, you know, when you get to the Nicene Creed and when you get to the fourth and fifth centuries. It, just because there were politics doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. You know, you know, politics may be how God worked in this particular, you know, Constantine's desire not to have a PR nightmare means that he gets these people together and means that they eventually come up with this really sublime statement, you know, of the of the full humanity of Christ. You know, and and they wouldn't have gotten there if Constantine hadn't wanted to say, stop it, guys. So mm. it, church history is so incredibly complex and so incredibly cultural and so incredibly political, you know. And when secular historians comment on this, that that's true, they're right. What I want to say is that doesn't mean, you know, there isn't really one God in three persons and we don't need to trust in Jesus Christ and put our whole hope, put our whole hope in him. It just means we need to also recognize these other things. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, uh, I'm really happy you're sharing that because it's, it's such a, a complicated mixture and you're, you're showing how complex it is with government and power and Christianity and how things are kind of fused and how, Actually, Constantine helped to basically help with the Nicene Creed by initiating, like, let's get some understanding, go work it out. Like, that's very interesting to see how government and the church kind of cooperated together with the formation of the Nicene Creed. Yeah. And I mean, Constantine, I, I don't think that there's any evidence that he, like, directed what they said, you know. But he was the organizing for, you know, one of the big organizing forces, you know, to say, you know, get this settled, guys, because, you know, people are out in the street having brawls over mm. what Arius is saying, you know, and that's simplifying it a little, but, you know, but it, it's, there are, you know, there are, there are groups of Christians that reject creedal statements uh, because they say they're not in the Bible. And that's true. The Nicene Creed is not in the Bible. Um, you know, the Apostles' Creed, which was not written by the Apostles, um, is not in the Bible. Um, you know, these are the productions, the Nicene Creed in particular, we know a lot more about how we came to have it, but, you know, the Nicene Creed is the, is the product of a political committee. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean God didn't use it to, to talk very clearly about something that is attested to in the Bible, which is the full humanity of Christ and the full divinity of Christ. You know, so, you know, I, I respect non-creedal churches but you know I'm, I'm also glad i belong to a creedal church and in the episcopal church we say the nicene creed every sunday in worship um you know and if we don't and there are a couple occasions when we don't say it but if we don't we say the apostles creed um, you know so we're always being reminded of that over and over and over again you know as, as a historian and as a priest as you are reciting the nicene creed are there things that like really stand out to you because you're you when you read the Nicene Creed, it's much different from what I'm reading it because you have so much of the history and the theology behind it. Different things stand out to me at different times. Uh, I long ago heard a story, and I wish that I could remember who it was that that told it, uh, but of someone saying that one of the things that they liked about reciting the creeds was knowing that when they were going through a dark night of the soul and when they were, you know, wrestling with things that the church was believing the creed for them, um, mm. and, and was sort of holding the creed for them until they could come back and believe it again. And I often, I often think of that, you know, and at various times in my, in my own life, when I've struggled with various aspects of faith, it's like, but, you know, I say this and it's like, here's this thing that for, you know, almost two millennia, I mean, 
for for two millennia, Christians have believed these things, and for almost two millennia, we've had this way to say it. Um, and and it's you know whatever I'm feeling at the moment, or whether I'm thinking about my grocery list, or whether I'm you know sort of doubting God's power. It's okay because the creed is reminding me, you know, that there is one God, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that Christ was fully human and fully divine, that he came down from heaven, that he was uh, crucified under Pontius Pilate, died, rose again, and you know, all those things. Um, it just, it, it hits, the, the, hit, the historicity of it, the ancientness of it hits me, you know, mm. almost every time I say the creed. Although I will admit that in the Episcopal Church, we say the creed right after the sermon. And so sometimes I'm just sort of like, oh, my gosh, I finished my sermon. I'm so happy. Oh, I'm halfway through the creed. Well, that's OK. I believe all those things. Uh, <laughs> you know, it feels like the creed is always there for us, you know, reminding us of. And I, and I you know, when I've gotten in a theological argument sometimes about about things, I'll say, you know, there there is a hill I will die on. And that hill is if it's in the Nicene Creed. You know, or the mm. Apostles' Creed, but there's nothing in the Apostles' Creed that's not in the Nicene Creed. You know, if it's sort of anything else, I may have a position on it. I may feel that that position can be supported by Scripture, uh, but I'm not going to die on that hill. I'm not going to die on the hill of any issue that is not in the Nicene Creed, uh, and and it's and it's tremendously spiritually important to me. I love that you also uh, talk about the Eucharist. And the debates that were happening with the Eucharist and the one of the reasons why the early church was persecuted was because people said that uh, Christians were being cannibals. I was wondering if you could talk about that. That was very fascinating to me. Yeah, uh, the, 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 well, I mean, Jesus says in John, you know, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And, and that language got picked up um, from there and then from what Paul wrote in Corinthians, uh, basically got sort of wholesale picked up into the liturgy. And so uh people were saying they were eating flesh and drinking blood and you know if you if you attend you know for example if you were heard people talking about this you know you overheard it out a window you came to the first part of the service and you know you people were trying to explain it to you after you know, however people you know there were spies you know however people heard about this they get they get a hold of this and they think well they're they're actually eating flesh and drinking blood um, you know and this is one of the you know, and so they're making, you know, human sacrifices. And I mean, this is the people who persecuted Christians were wrong. But, you know, I would want to persecute people that were making human sacrifice. I would th I would want to say you should not do this. Uh, so it was a tremendously uh, detrimental misunderstanding. Having said that, I think it's also important. And, you know, as an Anglican, this is something that I believe that that early Christians really thought they were eating flesh and drinking blood. Not in all, perhaps in all the ways that it gets sort of laid out very philosophically later, you know, in the doctrine of transubstantiation, but it was, for early Christians, it was never just a memorial meal. It was always about, you know, we remember Christ's death, you know, we participate in his death somehow by receiving these physical elements, um, and we look forward, you know, to the final banquet, the eschatological banquet, you know, where we're all, you know, we're all going to have dinner with Jesus in heaven. Uh, you know, and and the Eucharist was all of those things. And so many of the fights about the Eucharist throughout the church history are about to what degree it is each of those things um, and to what degree each, any of them might overshadow the other. You know, and um, in Catholicism, the stereotype anyway is, well, you know, it becomes all about the, the almost magic aspect of the bread and wine I don't think that's what's really going on in Catholicism, but that's certainly the misunderstanding that people have of it. You know, and then there's this, I, you know, a lot of Protestants have the idea, well, the Protestant thing to think about the Eucharist is that it's just a memorial. Um, and neither of those things are really sort of true on their own. Uh, you know, mm. I, I very strongly believe in the real presence of Christ in the communion elements. I believe I'm really eating his body and drinking his blood. Um, I don't believe it's, you know, physically turning into flash in front of me. I'm quite willing to leave this a mystery. Um, I don't really care how it happens, uh, but my experience of the Eucharist over the years convinces me that it happens. Um, and and yet I also don't want to lose the fact of, of the memory, you know, the, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're not repeating Christ's death. We're remembering something that happened. And, you know, 
I grew up Methodist and my favorite way to think about it is what the Wesleys thought, uh, which is also what Calvin thought. It's like the one thing West, the Wesleys and Calvin agree on. Um, not the one thing, but one of the things West, the Wesleys and Calvin agree on, which is that at the moment of the Lord's Supper, at the moment of Holy Communion Eucharist, you, you're not, remember, you're not repeating Christ's death now, you're going back there. You know, mm. you're actually at the sacrifice. And so it is Christ's body and blood, but you you didn't do it. You're sort of transported to the moment of the sacrifice. And to me, that's a beautiful way to think about what's going on um, and is the way, you know, on a personal spiritual level that I respond to it the most. Yeah, yeah that's, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful picture you just described there. I like that. Um, and also, I want to tell you that I really, uh, really appreciated how right after you address uh, Nicene Creed and a couple of different things. You go into the monastic movement, and I wanted to ask you about the monastic movement because you did uh, mention that in the beginning. Um, I feel like that part, at least for me, it's been kind of removed. Like I don't, I don't know too much about the monastic movement, and of course, I've heard of monasteries and and um, I know of some modern uh, people who have gone to monasteries, but I don't know too much about what was the. I guess like my question is like you had Christianity and government kind of working together in some way under Constantine. And so you see like this power Christianity and the church and government kind of working together. And then you had like this movement of monastics who were kind of, to me, it seems like moving out of the city and kind of doing something else. Is that, is that right? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very uh, good way to look at it. And it wasn't just Constantine, of course, it was Constantine. And, and with one exception, this one guy that tried to bring paganism back, but other than him, all of Constantine's successors. So Constantine not only makes Christianity legal, you know, eventually his successors make it, you know, the religion of the empire. And so a lot of people began asking the que the, the questions that we talked about earlier that, you know, can Christianity only sort of be practiced when it's persecuted and separate from the world? You know, is what just happened in the past, you know, hundred years a, a really bad thing? Should we try to recover the fervor of the early church by attempting to sort of recreate this by going out and living in the desert and living very simply and not, you know, involving ourselves in, in the government? And, and so, so the earliest monks, um, we didn't live in community. They would go out in the desert and they would be hermits. Um, and people might come and bring them food or come and learn from them. You know, they might write down some of their teachings. But, you know, at the very first, it was this very like, you know, you know what they're doing in the, you know, in the city, we're, we're going to reject that. Um, but, you know, it's it's really hard to survive out in the desert on your own for a long period of time. And, and all the many of the of the, the church fathers and church mothers, the Abbas and Amas, they were they're often called, did that. There also began to be this idea of like, what if we did this in community? You know, what if we had a, a simple life, a life where we, you know, where we practice poverty and chastity and obedience, but, you know, but, but there were a bunch of us. So, you know, we could have a farm and grow our own food and we could have worship services and we, you know, so um, it, it begins to develop the idea of communal monasticism and which is the way in which most of us in the West are most familiar with monasticism now, because this takes off. And of course, the problem is once you get people, this is the same problem of the church becoming legalized. Once you get people together in Christian community, you have to organize them. Once you organize people, you have to have bureaucracy. Once you have bureaucracy, you have a chance for corruption. And so over and over and over again, church history, you get people saying, this is the time when we're going to reorganize it in such a way that it won't become corrupt. And it never happens. <laughs> uh, and this happens with monasticism. Because eventually monasteries uh, get very large and very powerful, uh, and oftentimes the uh, the people who are, you know, in charge of the monastery might get called sort of they cooperate with the local government, or you know, monks might they wouldn't hold positions in government, but they you know they'd be out, you know, sort of out in the world dealing with things, yeah. and so nearly all the and, and the most. Um, prominent form of monasticism early on and the one that I talk about a lot because the sentence for that chapter is from Benedict's rule and Benedict's rule still basically guides many many people who are who are monks and nuns today uh you know but but some people say well the Benedictines you know they, they've become very rich and very powerful because they were and eventually there was a pope who was a Benedictine and you know people like this is not what we meant when we started this so you know so we get a reform movement 
you know, we get the Cluniac movement, and then we get a reform movement, and then we get the Cistercians, and then eventually, much later on, in, uh, you know, closer to our own time, we get a reform movement of the Cistercians, and we get the Trappist, which is what Thomas Merton was, uh, who's one of my uh, my great spirit- favorite spiritual writers. And every time they're like, we're, you know, we're going to do this right this time. Um, you know, and yet it never happens that way. And I, I don't know how to think about that other than that we can't sort of get that right on our own. Um, you know, and the way to, you know, in individual communities and in individual lives to get it right is to to keep discerning and looking to Christ and trying to, you know, to figure it out. But you're never going to solve all the problems just by having a renewal movement. I mean, many good things may happen because you have a renewal movement. You know, in the case of these monastic movements, you know, new monasteries would be established. Uh, people who had a, a vocation who might not have been able to get to X monastery. Well, now there's Y monastery, you know, in my town. I, you know, I really feel called to the monastic life. I'm going to explore this. So, you know, just like the spread of Christianity, lots of good things happened but it also, you know, once again became entangled with, you know, with power. And and that's a story I try to tell in that chapter. And of course, as a Protestant, you know, many people, myself, many people think, well, you know, there were monks and then, you know, there was Martin Luther and that was kind of the end of that. Well, no, um, there, there continued to be new uh, monastic orders, uh, new reforms, you know, all the way up until the present day. There are hundreds and thousands of people you know, in the Roman Catholic Church, who are monks and nuns. Uh, some, like Episcopalians, have religious orders, for instance, so there are some Episcopal monks and nuns. You know, it's actually, there There was, it's not talked about quite so much now, but, you know, 20 years ago or so, there was the new monasticism movement, and people like Shane Claiborne and Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove, and like, let's all live in houses together in the inner city. And I mean, Shane Claiborne's still doing that, but I don't see him in the news as much. But, you know, so there's still this people are still doing this people are still saying you know there's something about this life devoting myself to a life of prayer and service that's very very appealing to me it's not something that went away when martin luther just i think martin luther was not called to be a monk i think he was a stupendously bad monk you know (laughs) he seems very much to have called to have been married and to have children and be a protestant pastor uh but that doesn't mean that monks went away because martin luther stopped being one and i think protestants tend to think that this is still a very valid calling for you know like i said hundreds of thousands of people yeah yeah i want to ask you because uh so one of my questions is like so with the growth of the early church and i think of going back to acts right like the commandment to go out into all the world to preach the gospel and that definitely you know fired up people to go and evangelize and spread out and so that's super important for christianity to spread right going out to evangelize but then this movement of monasticism, of going out away really from the city and kind of having your own kind of spiritual home and uh, pursuing Christian virtues, which is a beautiful thing. And and I love Thomas Merton. Like I'm a huge fan and, and the monastic life like looks so appealing to me, <laughs> like the whole idea of like living in one place and kind of having a certain discipline of prayer and, and eating together as a community. Um, but what interests, what interests me is that that kind of calling uh, to live in a monastery seems different from the calling to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Can you talk a little bit about like that? Yeah, and I, I, I don't, I don't think that's the case because I think there are different ways to preach the gospel. I mean, Saint Saint Francis of Assisi almost certainly did not say preach the gospel everywhere, use words if necessary. We don't know who said that; it gets attributed to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a great thought, so I don't care who said it. So I think that, you know, at its best, monasticism preached the gospel, but in a different way, Um, you know, because one of the things that a a well-functioning monastic community can demonstrate is the ability to live in Christian community. Um, So, and first of all, there are some people who, for whatever reason, I think are are called to do that. Um, Secondly, one of the things that being in, and I haven't even talked about, like, friars that went around preaching everywhere like like Francis himself but but the the what is called the cloistered monastic life where you you know where you live in a monastery or, or a convent um secondly one of the things that that builds into your day is a tremendous amount of time to pray well, who are you praying for you're praying for the world mm. you know and for the people who might be more actively out there you know preaching or evangelizing in the ways that look more familiar to us and when I first, the first time I visited a monastery, which I talk about in the book, I was like, oh my gosh, this is why we're all still here. You know, these people, 
really love Jesus and they're praying like six mm-hmm. times a day um, and, and interceding, you know, for their own needs and for the needs of the monastery. But it's very much written into the ritual that you also intercede for the needs of the world. So I don't discount that at all. I mean, if we believe in prayer, you know, uh, we should be happy that there's this bunch of people that are devoting so much of their time to prayer. And obviously that doesn't absolve me from praying. I need also to pray in the world. Um, but these prayers are going up, you know, sort of like round the clock in support of those of us who are living a more active life in, in, in the world. You know, and then, and some people, the only way they can live out the life Christ calls them to, you know, and this was, I think, the case for Merton when he was, Merton couldn't really handle the world, you know, in, in, in the sense of the temptations of the world. And so when he went to the monastery, he still had a lot of trouble. He still, you know, fought with his superiors. He still found things annoying, but he needed that much discipline, you know, sort of in order to get right with Jesus, you know, and so for each person, it's different. And I think for someone like Martin, it's like this is this is the way in which they can live out their calling to follow the gospel, you know. And in his case, he ended up, of course, writing these books, which did preach the gospel, you know, to all of those who bought the books. But, you know, that isn't the case for for everybody. But there's still. You know, I think you balance it, you know, there's this call to the church as a whole to go out and spread the gospel. But each of us individually have to discern in our own lives what that looks like. You know, mm. does it look like standing on a street corner? Um, does it look like being a pastor? And yes, I do go out into the world, but also, you know, my job is to sort of try to empower the people to go out. You know, does it look like being a Christian on the job? Um, does it look like being part of an intentional Christian community and witnessing to the world? This is what it can look like if you get people together to follow Jesus, you know, all together. You know, does it look like praying for the world? I think there are all sorts of different ways that the gospel can be spread, you know, and that's why we need the body of Christ. And there's, you know, Paul has that whole thing about the foot's not the hand is not the ear is not the eye. You know, you need all of those. I love that. That's beautiful. I know we're up at our time, but one of the things I also wanted to thank you for is like, is acknowledging women and the movement of women in, in the early church. And you mentioned Perpetua. I don't know if I'm pronouncing Perpet- her name. Perpetua. Perpetua. Sorry. <laughs> Perpetua um, as being like the first kind of female Christian writer. Can you talk about her? Yeah, and we don't actually have like her stuff like, you know, in her own hand. What what we have of Perpetua is, is what uh what what Tertullian wrote down. Um and some of it does appear to have been what from what she wrote, you know, when she was in prison. You know, we don't know how he got a hold of it. Uh, you know, so but she's the she's cert- she's the first woman in the early church. I mean, I'm sure there are women in the early church who wrote things down. Um, I'm sure there are women in the early church who were martyred. But she's the first person for whom we sort of have the whole story, or at least a large part of the story. We know something about her life. Uh, we know that she wrote these things, even though we don't have the original manuscript. We know that, you know, we have later testimony that this is what what she told people. And then there's this added testimony of, you know, from you know, Tertullian or somebody else of, of what her death looked like, you know, so you've got this picture of what it was like to be a woman and to be a martyr. Um, and of course she was, and she was martyred with Felicity, um, who, you know, Perpetua was an upper class Roman woman. Felicity was a slave. Um, and you need to not think of that racially because it was a, a more of an economic thing in ancient Rome. Um, so, it says nothing about uh, Felicity's ethnicity is what I'm trying to say, you know, but, but, you know, Felicity also, her story's in there. So we know, you know, we know what, ha- we know what happened to upper class people who followed Christ. We know what happened to, you know, slaves and servants who followed Christ. We see this whole picture of, of, of martyrdom, you know, plus it's, it's so beautiful, you know, her testimony um, of what it was like to, follow Christ and to be in prison. And, you know, she's so concerned, you know, she's mostly concerned for her, for her infant son. And once she knows her infant son is taken care of, you know, then she's ready to die. She has these beautiful visions of Christ saying, I'm going to fight with you. I can cry if I talk about it any longer, you know, it's just an amazing story. Um, you know, and so I love thinking about her and about how she stands in for all those other upper class, because Christianity appealed to a lot of uh, Roman matrons. Um, you know, she stands in for all the ones whose stories we don't know, you know, because she was able to write this down. It was preserved. People saw her death and wrote about that. And she's just she's she's one of my heroes. And like I said, we we know very little of her outside of this one story, but we know quite a bit from that. Yeah, that's super interesting because it is as you talk about class and how Christianity impacted because like 
especially going back to what you said in the very, very beginning, how Christianity could definitely be attractive to those who were enslaved, those who um, uh, who needed or, or felt like, um, obviously the message of Christianity appeals to all, uh, but especially those who feel like they've been marginalized, those who have been hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's a beautiful story of like how, how Christianity impacted someone who was upper class. Yeah, and it... it... It, it, it was the case in Roman society that the, the authority of the Roman paterfamilias, and that's where we get the word that we still sometimes use in English, was absolute. So even though his wife might have been from a you know from a wealthy family, you know, he could do what he you know, he could beat her, he could divorce her, he could have affairs. Mm. There wasn't a thing she could do. So there was you know there was an obvious appeal in Christian in, in the sort of equality of Christianity um, to to those who were more obviously marginalized because, you know, you could be enslaved and yet you could become, you know, a great le- a leader in the early Christian community and, and well-respected. Um, and we see, you know, we see this even in Philemon in the Bible and Onesimus, and we don't know exactly what happened, but somehow Onesimus has become really, you know, crucially important to Paul and a leader in the community. And yet he's also enslaved and Paul's, you know, asking his owner to, to free him. You know, but there's also this appeal to these women who in many ways had, you know, they had all the clothes and food and servants and whatever they could desire, but they had no, they had absolutely no power. Their husbands could do anything to them, you know, and so, and I don't know anything about Perpetua's husband, who never, as I recall, shows up in the story, but, um, you know, so there's an, also an appeal to that, like, you know, here is an arena in which I can be respected, um, you know, and I can, you know, meet with other people and, and also you know, be on a equal basis with, with those who were enslaved. And I think some people probably had to get over that. Like, you know, here's Perpetua and Felicity, and they may be mistress and slave, but in the, um, in the Christian community, they're equal. Uh, you know, so I think, I think, you know, not to go down a rabbit trail, but the appeal of Christianity to women in that position in the early church is really fascinating. Well, Dr. Tate, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking about your brand new book. For those that want to learn more about you and your work, uh, what's the best, best way for them to do that? Uh, well, uh, the best way is to go uh, to the University Press website uh, for the book, which is Christian History in Seven Sentences, uh, which will tell you some more about the book and also has some biographical information about me. I also have a page on Goodreads, um, which has, so if you search for me on Goodreads, you know, I'm there. I have some Q&A and links to my blog and to the, the other things I've written and stuff. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure to uh, I'll make sure to link out to all the different resources, your page, and also your bio on um, Christian History Magazine. So, thank you so much, Dr. Tate. You're welcome. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video clip from the Dogato Podcast. To get more videos like this, simply subscribe here on YouTube. You can also download the full episode of each show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or your favorite podcast player. Take care.